First, have a quick look at the properties of the labor demand. It's going to be very important. Then do just a couple of comparative statics. So you know we are going to change the value of some of the parameters to see a little bit how, uh, how the labor demand moves when these parameters um, change. So let's look at the properties of labor demand. Once you derive result like this, it's always important to try to see like, what are the properties and what it tells us, how they translate, so how the mathematical properties translate into the real world. What does it tell us about the real world? All right, so let's see. Uh, what do we want to know here a little bit? Uh, well, what's um, quite interesting is to try to figure out how the labor demand is going to depend on tightness, because um, as we've seen before, we'll try to represent um, you know, demand and supply in a market diagram that involves tightness. So we want to know a little bit how um, the labor demand is going to depend on tightness. Okay? So let's try to see. So first, let's try to see what happens if theta is equal to zero. Okay? So always start with some extreme value and then, and then you move your way back. Uh, towards more standard values. So let's start at theta equal to zero. We want to know at the extreme what happens. Theta equal to zero, so you remember that tau of theta is equal to um, zero, because we saw that tau of zero is equal to zero. And so uh, what do we see? Well, the value of zero, and so we infer that when tightness is equal to zero, the labor demand at zero W, it's going to be therefore a alpha divided by w, uh, just the wedge, because um, tau of theta is just zero to the power of one over one minus three. Okay? Uh, so when the tightness is zero, uh, firms they want a certain amount of workers that's given by this equation. So this is telling us what happens if there were no tightness. Okay, great. So now the question is what happens as the tightness goes up? Okay, uh, so we want to know how what, what is a derivative of the labor demand with respect to tightness. So here the labor demand depends on two variables, tightness and um, wedge, so we need to take a partial derivative. So what is the sign of the partial derivative of tightness of a labor demand with respect to tightness? Well, we are not going to take the derivative, it will be quite a complicated expression, but we can look at the variables and functions involved in the labor demand and figure out what happens. So imagine that tightness goes up. Okay. Um, so let's have a little bit of reasoning here. Tightness goes up. What happens? Well, we have to see what happens to tau of theta. So you remember that the recruiter producer ratio was increasing in tightness. When there is more competition, now on the firm side, the firm post more vacancies, it's harder to fill vacancies and therefore firms have to devote more recruiters to the recruiting process. So we know that when the tightness goes up, tau of theta the recruiter producer ratio goes up. Okay? And from this you infer that 1 plus tau of theta alpha is also going to work, of course. Now this is in the denominator of our labor demand. So if I continue my reasoning, I infer that A alpha divided by W1 plus tau of theta alpha, that's going to go down because 1 plus theta alpha is in the um, denominator. And then all of this, this big expression A alpha W1 plus tau of theta alpha, that's exponentiated with the exponent 1 over 1 minus alpha. The 1 over 1 minus alpha that's always a positive number. Okay, so you have something that goes down. You put a positive exponent to it. It's also going to go down. A positive exponent is not going to change how uh, this expression depends on alpha. So we infer that uh, since the exponent is positive, we know that a alpha w one plus tau So all of this, that's also going to go down. And so, but this is just the labor demand. So when tightness goes up, we've just learned that the labor demand is going to go down. Okay? So what we've learned is that um, the labor demand 
is actually decreasing in tightness. Okay, so at zero tightness, the labor demand is equal to something, and then the labor demand is going to be decreasing. Uh, is going to be decreasing in tightness from there. What's the intuition for that? You know, why is it that firms they want fewer workers when the tightness is higher? Well, it all comes from the recruiting side. So when the tightness is higher, it's harder to recruit workers, right? So it means that firms have to allocate more workers to recruiting. What it means is therefore that the, the firm's operations are less profitable because for a given number of workers that they pay all their workers the same, they have to allocate more workers to recruiting. But when they do that, it means that they allocate fewer workers to production, which is where the money comes from and for, for firms. So when you have a high tightness, the firm is forced to have fewer workers making money and more workers doing the recruiting, so it's less profitable to operate. And as a result, the firm wants to have a, a smaller size. Okay? So it's always like that your marginal cost, uh, in a sense, become higher. Uh, and so you're forced to have a, a smaller size. So you know, here you want to maximize profit. So the rule of thumb for the firm is marginal cost equal marginal benefit. If you have marginal costs that are higher, you need to have many marginal benefits that are also higher. And because we have diminishing marginal returns to labor, uh, you know, due to the shape of the production function, the only way to get higher marginal benefits is to have fewer workers. You know, basically, you only keep your more productive workers. Um, and that allows you to uh, allocate you know, marginal cost is equal to marginal benefits. Okay? Um, so basically, if you have higher marginal cost, the firm will want to have a smaller size. And so that's why the labor demand is decreasing in, uh, is decreasing in tightness. Okay. Another property that's going to be interesting, uh, do you remember that the recruiter-producer ratio at the vertical asymptote at t time? So what happens at t time? So we know that at t time, tau of theta, you know that's the state of the world where <laughs> basically, um, all workers are recruiters. So tau of theta goes to infinity. And if you look at the expression, if you look at the expression for the labor demand, you infer that therefore, because tau of theta is in the denominator, the labor demand um, goes to zero. So basically, what we have is that the limit where theta goes to theta from below, of course, of the labor demand is zero. Okay, and so. Um, that summarizes you know, what we need to know. So if we want, we can also plot a little diagram like I did with tau. Just to illustrate, I can put um, theta in here. I put my theta on the x-axis and then I put L, the labor demand just to um, see what happens and summarize the results. So labor demand at zero, we saw that it was equal to some number. Um, and in fact, if we go up, we'll see what it was, uh, this thing here. So at zero, I have some value, which is A alpha lambda W, one over one minus alpha. This is my labor demand. And then I have something that's decreasing and that reaches zero here at the time. So, you know, maybe my labor demand is going to look something like this. Okay, um, so that's the labor demand. And the idea is that as tightness goes up, you need to have uh, more and more workers that are allocated to uh, recruiting, and so that makes uh, the production less profitable. So you want to have less workers total. Okay, so your labor demand is going to look something like this. Okay, um, so we are um, essentially uh, essentially um, done here. Um, right, another quick thing we can do. Well, so two little things we can do uh, just to wrap up. Let's see. So here I've showed you a labor demand with tightness on the um, x-axis, just to show show it to you as a function. Of course. Uh, what's useful is to represent the labor demand in a market diagram. Which is a diagram with 
employment on the x-axis and uh, tightness on the y-axis. So these are the diagrams that will always use. Remember, we want a model uh, that, according to Kuhn, is a help to memory. So we want a model that's very simple to represent with little diagrams. Um, so remember, market diagram, we have These are, these are different diagrams than, than before. Here, what I want is go back to my market diagram where I put employment on the x axis, the size of the labor force H here, and my tightness, which acts as a price on the y axis. And so, what I want is cast, recast the result that we've seen in that diagram. Um, so, what I know is that. At a value t time of tightness, my labor demand is going to be equal to zero. So I know that I'll be here. And then as I know that as the tightness goes down, the labor demand is going to actually, uh, is going to, as tightness goes down, the labor demand is going to increase. So I have a decreasing function here. So my labor demand is going to maybe look something like this in that diagram. Okay. Um, and here at zero, we know what is the value here. It's what we had said was a alpha something. And uh, there is no presumption actually that this a alpha divided by w uh, with an exponent one over one minus alpha is smaller or bigger than h. Actually, the two things could happen. So you could have that. You could also have a demand that looks like this instead. That's also another possibility. Okay, uh, both things are possible. Okay, uh, but essentially that's how the labor demand is going to look in the in the market diagram. Okay, great. Um, right, and last thing that we can do uh, now that we have this is do just one or two comparative statics. Okay, so. Do you remember comparative statics? The goal here is to change value of some of the parameters and see, uh, see what happens. So what are interesting comparative statics to do? Well, one that's very interesting is what happens if the wage uh, goes up, right? Uh, and if we go back to our expression of the labor demand, let me just go back to the notes a little bit, right? You can see here the wage is in the denominator. Here, and so if the wage goes up, the labor demand is going to be lower. So again, kind of the same logic. If you have higher marginal cost, higher wage, the firm is going to try to reduce the size of its operation. Okay. So we know that the labor demand is going to fall if you have higher wages. Okay. So that's, uh, that's pretty simple. So if we go back to our diagram here, basically, if you have a higher wage, your labor demand is going to, uh, to fall, so it's going to do something like this. So that's what happens when the wage <coughs> when the wage goes up. So in fact, it's a rotation uh, because theta m uh, actually doesn't change the value of theta m, which was def which was uh, defined such that q of theta m is equal to r s uh, doesn't change here. So when you have a higher wage, your labor demand is going to rotate uh, around theta m like this. Okay, um, so you have smaller operation. If your wage goes down, it's cheaper to hire workers. The opposite uh, the opposite will be true. Okay, so that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting comparative statics here. Another comparative statics we can do uh, is what happens if uh, suddenly the uh, workers become more productive. So that's what happens if you have higher wages. It could be many reasons why wage go up. So for instance, if you're in a low wage industry, the minimum wage goes up, your wages are going to go up for everybody. That would be the case. And what happens if A goes up? So that's what happens if you have higher labor productivity. Uh, 
Uh, okay, and so that could be because you have a technological innovation because suddenly your workers are more skilled or something like this. Uh, because you've discovered a new way to produce things more efficiently. You have new software, for instance, uh, better organization. So for all these reasons, productivity may go up. So what happens to the labor demand if you have a higher productivity? Well, we can go back to our labor demand expression. And you see productivity here, uh, unlike the way it's in, uh, it's in the numerator. And so if the productivity goes up, the labor demand is going to go up. So if your workers are more productive, of course, it's more profitable to operate, and that's going to boost labor demand. Okay, so we can represent that also in our little diagram. Um, let me use a different color to separate. So that's the opposite that could happen. If you have higher productivity, you'll get something like this. And you get a labor demand that's further out, so that's uh, you know, further on to hire more workers. All right, um, so I think that concludes uh, what we have to know about the labor demand. Now we have a labor demand, we have a labor supply, we'll be able to study the equilibrium of the market.